Hello, I'm Nishan Dion, and you're watching Transbrations. Today's special guest is Pablo Morales. He is a writer, director, and producer, and is a graduate of John Muir High School, class of 1982, and has over 30 years of experience in the visual communications field. In 2008, Pablo founded Arroyo Seco Films to create TV, film, and digital media productions that are challenging and entertaining. His first feature under the Arroyo Seco Film banner was the award-winning feature documentary, Gringos at the Gate, Soccer and the U.S.-Mexico Divide, a film that examines the history and passion surrounding one of the world's greatest national soccer rivalries. The film was broadcast on the ESPN Sports Network for three years. His most recent film is the award-winning documentary, Can We All Get Along? The Segregation of John Muir High School, which earned him a 2019 Indie Fest Humanitarian Award, two LA Press Awards, and a local LA Emmy nomination in 2022. Currently, Pablo is directing, writing, and producing a K-12 educational film focusing on Owen Brown, son of John Brown, and the local Southern California connection to the abolitionist family. Pablo served as production coordinator on Cedar Grove Productions Academy Award-winning short film, Visas and Virtue, and co-producer on their Emmy-nominated short film, Day of Independence. He received his BA from Sonoma State University and his MFA from the UCLA Graduate Film Program, where he won the UCLA Spotlight and MPAA Student Filmmaker Awards. Pablo, thank you for joining me. How are you doing today? I'm doing very well. Thank you for inviting me. I remember seeing your film. This had to be I guess when, when did it come out? The first version came out in 2019. That was the, uh, what I call the festival cut. And then we re-released it with PBS in 21, broadcast in 22. I must have started seeing you promoting it in 2019. And obviously mm -hmm. I was drawn to it because of Can We All Get Along? I grew up with Rodney King's family. And when that happened to him, me and my mother, we were living behind his mother on Sunset Avenue. So I woke up to hearing all kinds of just drama and noises and, you know, throughout mm -hmm. the years that obviously impacted my, my community and my family. And so when I saw the film, I wasn't sure quite what to, to, to expect at first, but obviously, you know, reading the reading more about it, the desegregation of, of Mir, you know, obviously I, I understood and it was a very fitting title for the film. I always felt that way. For me, it was, it was fascinating to learn about Pasadena's history through your lens. To my knowledge, you are the only person in Altadena and Pasadena who explores things that have to do with race and class. I'm I don't not the only, but I think I'm the only one who does it through film and television. Through film and television, right. And someone who went to Mirror. I think you have to go to Mirror to understand it completely. And that's a personal opinion. I'm sure there's some books, some other things, but it hasn't came onto my radar for, for whatever reason. But obviously your film spoke directly to me. The title, Mirror, Pasadena. I learned so much about Pasadena's history. It was just amazing. I learned stuff that no one in my community was talking about. And some of them may have not even known, you know, people were so busy, you know, going to work or, you know, in the 80s, we started to have the, the, the drug. Drugs impacted the community really bad. There were you know, issues with gangs. So nobody was really pretty much talking about the history of John Muir and Pasadena segregation, desegregation. You know, there was a reason I didn't put that stuff in the film too. I noticed and- Because, because it was happening everywhere. It was. My, my focus on that film was John Muir High School and what made it unique. Mm -hmm. If it was happening everywhere else in, the context of how people were viewing communities, let alone public school communities, I felt that that's already in their heads. They know. They know that there was a crack epidemic. They know there was um, gangs. Gangs existed, but the gangs existed everywhere. The th what, what made it, and this was actually something that Cameron Turner and I talked about really early on, he felt that if we emphasize the negatives of that, then we're basically, again, ghettoizing the Northwest and West Altadena, right? Because it's not like the effects of drugs and gangs weren't everywhere, but we look at communities of color as where these things are, are focused. And that's just not the story. The story is not that, you know, as I said, my niece thought we lived in the ghetto. I can tell you there was like one family I would have been aware of 
in my neighborhood who were associated with the old Pyrus in South Central. But I could was, also play street that, football. That, that with was them. the ghetto family. Yes. Well, yeah. I won't use the word ghetto because I think ghetto is 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 a derogatory comment sure. about people who are are forced to live together, right? And they were forced to live together because of redlining. And I want to talk about that. I'll talk about that, sure. Mm -hmm. I'll talk about the kind of housing discrimination mm -hmm. that led to, you know, we lived in a house in West Altadena that in the original deed said no Oriental colored or Jewish people could live there. Now, by the time we moved there in 71, that didn't have any legal bearing, but it was not that long before that, that that did have legal bearing, right? Mm -hmm. So those, those are gangs, drugs, all that stuff. That is a product of the segregation, mm -hmm. right? But I'm not celebrating the segregation. Yeah. I'm celebrating the desegregation, desegregation, the integration, if you will. And when those things happen, those things don't exist. See, that's the thing. And yeah, integration can be negatively seen because of gentrification. I know we t you touched on some of your, your questions and it is a big issue. And I became very good friends with, I don't know if you know, Shea Shea Yancey and their family who rented the house to the King family there on Lincoln back in the day. You know, you know, okay. So, you know, that house, so obviously I, you know, knew yeah, you're right down the corner. I know. Yeah. Right. So we, that, that was b before they moved to sunset, that is where they were at and our families would be there often. Um, right. yeah, the, the house, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that, I know, you know there. it. So the, the interesting thing is, cause I did a lot of research, you know, mm -hmm. I did not go into this thinking if you're a filmmaker and you're touching on issues of race and you're, and you're white, honestly, I'm white Hispanic you're going to be attacked by people who don't know you because they're going to make the assumption that you don't know. You really don't know, right? What you're talking about. And that and is- and that, and, and that you're being exploited. Yeah. I'm a drive-by filmmaker is what we call it nowadays where, oh, I'm going to make a film. Well, you're, great example. Uh, I have a, uh, I have a, uh, I'm not going to call my friend, an acquaintance who's a documentary filmmaker. He makes his living making films about trans children, right? Mm -hmm. Very beautiful films. Nothing wrong with the films, but he's cis, male, white, mm. right? So outside of the subjects that he's interviewing and getting to know, he's not part of that community. Got you. Mm -hmm. Right? So I went to a screening of his and one a trans person got up and said, you know, I, I consider you a drive-by filmmaker. How come you didn't have somebody co-directing or co-writing who knows our stories? From the inside, yeah. and it was, and I felt fair point, fair point. That, that, is, that, that is a fair point. When I first saw the title, I was just like, it's like, I was like, no, he didn't. Like, he actually named his, you know, he, you know, used his his quote or whatever. And I was like, I was like, you know, um, but then of course my attitude shifted once I saw the film, and you know, obviously, again, it was very fitting for the film. I think I had shared it with his daughter and mentioned it to her. I don't know if, at this point if she's seen it or not. I shared it with my, you know, friends, my mother. Uh, Do you, you, you went to school with him. Do you ever remember seeing him or? No, I, I, I do know a lot of people who knew him well. And Rodney a lot King. of people were, when I first, first, first came up with the concept of the film and the title, he was still alive. And I was doing research. I was reading his books, his personal autobiography, mm -hmm. and I was preparing to meet with him. Uh, his sister was a friend, a good friend of a friend of mine I went to school with. Natasha. Yeah. yeah. And unfortunately, I wasn't ready to do the interview before he passed away. I had I didn't start full time interviews until what October of 2012. So yeah, he was gone almost a full year before I actually started production. So it was disappointing. Mm -hmm. And I think of all the things that are in the film, but, but for me, the reason it always worked for me, the title is because I knew a lot of people in LA. I was in film school during the riots or just came out 91, 92. So I was around at Paramount Studios. I was working for independent uh, production company 
and it was a white central centered environment. And the comments being made about this thug who probably deserved it, right? Yeah. And I'm like, I didn't know him. I didn't know he went to the school I went to. I didn't know anything about it. But I knew instinctively he didn't deserve that, right? Nobody deserves that. And I'm not sure I was very vocal about it because, you know, it's a new kid in the world there. But it always bothered me. And then there was a little bit of the backlash from the Black community, the militant Black community, you know, rap songs being done about how he was a punk because he didn't, you know, right. get out in the street and fight. And then finally, over the course of that year, he gets up and talks and he's saying what I would like anyone who cares about the community to say. Let's think about the children. Let's think about the old people. I just want to say, you know, can we can we all get along? Can we can we get along? Um, can we stop making it making it horrible for for the for the older people and the, and the and the kids? And I mean, we've got enough smog here in Los Angeles. Um, let alone to uh, d deal with the uh, setting these fires and. And thing is, it's, it's just not right. It's not right, and um, it's not. It's not gonna. It's not gonna change anything. Um, we'll we'll get our justice. Um, they've won the battle, but they haven't won the war. We we'll have our day in court, and that's all we want. And just uh, I I love I, you know I'm. I'm neutral. I love every. I love people of color. You know, I'm. I'm not a. I'm not like they. Picking me out. Picking me out to be. Um, we've got to. We've got to quit. We've got to quit. You know. After all, I mean. I can understand the the, the first upset for the first two hours after the verdict, but uh, to go on to keep going on like like this and to see the security guard shot on the on the ground it um it's it's uh it's just not right it's just not right because those people are, are, will never go home to to their families again and uh i mean please we can we can get along here we we all can get along we just gotta just gotta you know, I mean, we're all stuck here for a while. Let's, you know, let's, let's, let's try to work it out. Let's try to beat it, you know. And by then I had learned he'd been, he grew up, you know, five blocks from me in uh, West Altadena. And it, and it just struck me then. I remember writing in, a, I had a, a journal I was working on at the time with film ideas. And in there I wrote, can we all get along? Not rhetorical. He knows that we can because he grew up in the same community at the same time during desegregation. I know that he had white friends. I know that he had Mexican friends. Mm -hmm. I know like any other kid who has a very difficult childhood as he had, and I read his autobiography, that you, those are not the things that define you. You know, what defines you is how you react to crisis. And when crisis came to him, he thought of the community and what was best for them. And I was proud that he was from my community and I was proud. I would have loved to have talked to him, honest to God, we would have had a great conversation. And I, I would have hoped to have pulled out some of the things that I feel were in what I heard and what I read. And that's all right, because the point is, what separates us is not real, I guess is a way to put it. Laws, prejudice, racist attitudes, fear, primarily. Those don't exist once you get to know each other, okay? I know that from my own personal experience. I'm not saying that from some ivory tower in the upside, the west side of New York, where I've always gone to private schools and, and the only black people were token who either got in on scholarship or who had parents who were wealthy. I know that because I grew up in a racially and socioeconomically mixed environment. 
If child is black, if child is white, the whole world looks upon the side. A beautiful side. My name is Pablo Morales. Tom Near High Class 1982. And I need your help to tell some amazing stories of a special time and place. Located near the minority neighborhoods of Pasadena and Altadena, John Muir has always been Pasadena's other high school. A stepchild to the city's namesake on the white side of town. Muir has impressive and diverse alumni from David Lee Roth to Jackie Robinson. When a judge ordered Pasadena Unified desegregated in 1970, Muir became fully integrated, and for 15 years, its yearbooks had every ethnicity on each page. By the mid-80s, a committed political opposition using the ballot box to defund schools brought an end to busing, and some believe quality public education everywhere. So what has become of Muir's children of desegregation? And what did our stories and the history of our school say about the current and future state of public education? When Muir alum Rodney King asked, can we all get along? Was he remembering his own childhood when the question didn't seem rhetorical? Your child is black, your child is white, together they grow. I mean, one of the, one of the things that uh, somebody asked me recently, another interview, like, what is it that your child is, should get out of moving to Altadena? And I said, what I hope he gets out of it is that when we moved into the house, I was able to pick up the phone and have a plumber carpenter, a CPA, and a lawyer, all being black men and friends of mine who could help us when we needed help. That that, it didn't matter that they didn't come from money. It didn't matter. And that I that my son doesn't have to be scared of black males because that's who it focuses on. And that my best friends growing up were all black. And I never thought of it as that until I left. It's like, that was the theme of so much of the things I worked on or when I would do my pre-interviews, or I don't know if you saw the little film that I made about the class of 81 that was sort of like a precursor to- No, I know, didn't get I didn't get a chance to I didn't, see it. I haven't promoted it. I made it for the class of 81 for their reunion. I'll shoot you a link if you're interested. It's only 10 I, minutes. I would love to love to see that. Mm -hmm. But the, the theme that came out was, yeah, we grew up in this wonderful world. I didn't know it was wonderful until I moved away. I'm so happy that we went off on this tangent because I didn't have any questions really, but I had a question about some of the, the footage, but that was a production thing or whatever. But now we'll ask you this. You didn't get a chance to interview him. You wanted to interview him for the film, Rodney King. Why didn't you use archival footage of him in the film other I, than, other than the, the incident? Well, I think multiple reasons. First and foremost would probably be money. The money I spent for archival footage had to really push the narrative. Rodney King, because I wasn't able to interview him, I didn't want to put words in his mouth since I couldn't interview him. And I didn't want to overplay the effects of that emotional, that, emo that moment in the film where I bring him in because for me, it's about, look at you watching this movie across the United States, have probably a preconceived idea of who Rodney King is, where he grew up. It's like Jackie Robinson. People think he grew up in some poor black neighborhood. He grew up in a middle class, lower middle class, but still middle class. He was the first black family on the street, not an all black family you know, street, black street. Over time, because he, there, Molly was the mother was ahead of the curve on, on moving into that part of the town, came all black. But the thing is, where you grow up and the environment you grow up, I think dictates who you end up becoming at your core. So long as you interact with the world around you, you can yeah. you know, hide away from it. You could, you know, I, I know people uh, very well who grew up in wonderfully diverse neighborhoods, but for whatever reason, their parents made sure they went to the good schools away from home to get away from the negative influences of their own community. And I totally get it, especially if it's a black family who's had bad experiences. You, you know, America doesn't offer you a lot of opportunities to, to get into better situations. I've never 
uh, my film is focused on white Americans because mm -hmm. I don't think I have any place in criticizing black middle-class families that are avoiding public schools for fears that they understand that I don't, right? That's not, not what it is. It's important to me that, to the Rodney King thing, he's an icon. Why is he? He's an icon because somebody had a videotape machine in 1991 mm -hmm. and we got to see, America got to see what happened daily, thousands of times a week across the United States. That's the lesson of Rodney King. He himself, and this is why it wasn't so important that I get him in the film in that way. He's an icon. He's, he's, the same way Jackie Robinson's an icon. I don't need to have the story of Jackie Robinson in my film for people to understand the impact of being from the school that he went to. Yeah. Right? Although in the play that I'm writing, I'm getting into that because I think it's important that, you know, Branch Rickey knew that this kid was going to be okay in a white team um, because he had grown up around white kids, right? That's what Branch Rickey wrote. I think, as, as I like to say, from all of the schools during the time that Jackie Robinson went to schools, none were black majority. His graduating class at Washington Junior High, I have a photo of it somewhere right around here somewhere. There's only like three black kids in Washington graduating in 1935 mm. from Washington Junior High. That would be 10th graders, right? Mm. Because it, they don't build that gigantic, beautiful school on the hill for black kids. They build it for white kids, right? Mm -hmm. Now, subsequently, because of America's America and white people are white people, they moved out of the neighborhood because black people were moving in. But um, I think it's important that, you know, when he when he went to Dodgers, yeah, he had showered with white boys. You know, that wasn't a big deal. Most of those white boys had not showered with black men. Black but men. Mm -hmm. that's the other way around. That's but that's not on them. That's on, you know. At his 30th high school reunion, filmmaker Pablo Morales questions what has happened to his once integrated public high school in Pasadena, California. Later, he reflects on whether to send his own son to the school today. Gradually, he begins to understand how perceptions and policies have created almost insurmountable challenges to maintaining well-funded and diverse public schools. You've mentioned the name Cameron Turner on two or three different occasions. His mother creating the, the initial... Spirit Task Force. That's what it was. Pardon me? Spirit Task Force for Mirror. It was a way... Because people had stopped caring about the community, so she wanted to do something about it. So it was the Spirit Task Force. Okay. Cameron Turner was going to initially narrate your film and appear on camera. His passing threw you adrift, um, according to an interview you said, his passing threw you adrift and had a significant impact on his development. You found Courtney Nickton, the founder of Integrated Schools. After conversing with Courtney, you enrolled your son in an integrated school. If you hadn't mm -hmm. been introduced to Courtney and the concept of integrated schools, do you believe your film would have followed the same trajectory and direction? Yeah, I think that's a little erroneous. I always wanted my son to be in an integrated school. Courtney, who unfortunately also passed away, I swear there was a time when I thought like everyone who was involved in this was gonna die. She started a organization in 2015 called integratedschools.org. And she was coming at it from moving from an all white community to Los Angeles, Northeast Los Angeles, Highland Park, figuring that just like back East, they would just send their kid to the public school, but she was told by all the other gentrifying families that no one goes to that school. That was her awakening to the concept of that we don't have integrated schools because by no one, they really mean no white kids. Okay. So I was already four years into my project by then. Uh, I'd had already one cut. I was so excited to find a national organization that was talking the same themes. I, I've, I personally, I've never left. And if you know the story of unincorporated coffee, <laughs> a mural in West Oh, right, Africa. yeah, that's, and that's a question. Why is it that I saw that differently than all the other white neighbors of mine, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. It's not just art. I know it's not just art. I know how that affects mm -hmm. my neighbors emotionally. Uh, that is what allowed me to make this film. That's what allowed me not to be a drive-by filmmaker. I'm not just noticing something wrong with my school after I graduated. Mm -hmm. I was a participant in the desegregation. 
of not just my high school, but all the schools in Pasadena. I come back to find that there is not only there's no desegregation, but we are segregated in a way that perhaps West Altadena and West Pasadena have never been. Right? Because even though the numbers might have switched from black to white or brown, no one was ever like thinking that the schools were bad, right? They were just inaccessible. They were drawing attendance lines that would ensure that Elliot, for example, was all white even though black kids had already started moving into Altadena. Okay, so that's integrated schools, which I'm still a part of, and I'm and I'm a co-founder of the Pasadena Integrated Schools, but I come at it from a different attitude. I come at it from, hey, we had integration. A lot of the places they're talking about didn't. Mm -hmm. And this is and and so I'm not I'm not coming at it from that same perspective. Now, in terms of Cameron, Cameron's death was a real blow because it's his fault that I even making the movie. He right. Tell us about briefly. Tell us how that. So this thing called Facebook shows up, and people from high school reconnect it. Because I have a pretty diverse group of high school friends, I get a lot of, a lot of great. Immediately, the Muir community is building back together. And Cameron, who I knew from fifth grade, he was in sixth. I was in fifth. He jumps on a, a comment about her schools. And then he started his own thread that just said, we were lucky to go to Pasadena schools in the 70s. And I did not have the awareness to know that Pasadena was the first school district outside the South to be desegregated. I He did. He understood the families that fought to get them desegregated and why. And so I wrote back and said, I had no idea we were lucky. Can we meet for coffee? And that coffee led to hours and hours of conversation. Eventually, I started videotaping them because every single one was like a master class in my own childhood. It gave me the foundation for understanding that became the film. I, I didn't learn that, that until watching your film as well. It's not something Pasadena thinks is a proud thing. I personally think it's something we should have commemorated with a statue with a bus somewhere. I think that'd be cool. So he, well, he was he was a television personality. He was great on camera. I recognized the charisma. I'm like, you're my guy. You're going to tell this to the world how we were lucky to go to school in Pasadena in the 70s, right? We have got to work deliberately and boldly to dismantle the counterproductive, socially corrosive beliefs and attitudes which cause far too many of our young people to fall short of their God-given potential. See, we have to boldly promote the truth, the truth that getting good grades, working hard in school, being educated, being an upright citizen, these are not the qualities of a sellout, no. No, 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 no. We've got to promote the truth that intelligence, academic excellence, good citizenship, these are the keys to, this, to success. And they are the distinguishing characteristics of great men and women who laid the foundation for us. Indeed, these are the qualities of kings and queens. And this is what we've got to empower our young people to know. We have got to carve out as if it were cancer this long-standing lie that black and Latino young people are not supposed to be smart. I heard it when I was at Elliott. I heard it when I was at Muir. And some of our young people are still hearing it. How tragic it is. We've got black and brown kids walking around with the genius intelligence put in them by the creator, and they're ashamed to let the world know. Don't want to be seen with a textbook. Don't want to discuss current affairs and intellectual concepts because somebody who looks like them is going to make them feel bad about it. That is a cancer. Somebody lied to us. Somebody lied to us a long time ago. And the lie was so well told and so convincing that some of us internalized it. And we started telling it to each other. And we have young black and brown men and women walking around in confusion, don't even know, don't even realize that they are the direct descendants of the people who built the pyramids. They don't understand 
So we've got to let them know. We've got to empower them and remind them all the time that down through the ages, our people have always been smart, intellectual, professional, effective, accomplished <laughs> builders. We have always participated in every level of society. As I say, we are the descendants of those people who built the pyramids, some of the oldest, most powerful effigies, thousands of years old, standing as strong as they did as if they were built yesterday. We've got to let our young people know when they're worried about, you know, am I supposed to be intellectual, say, son, daughter, let me tell you what, don't you know you are the descendant of the scholars of Timbuktu? and of Cordoba. And if you don't know what those cities are, sit down, I'll open the book and I'll help you know about it. Because when you know, you'll feel proud. All the Aztecs, the Toltecs, the Mayas, they were some of the greatest mathematicians and astronomers on earth. And our young people, when they know this, will understand that it is their legacy, it is their destiny to carry on that legacy. And so when we talk about advocating for social justice, let us continue to remind our young people that they were born for greatness, that the creator of the very universe placed in each one of us a divine spark, some talent, intellect, aptitude, a unique, beautiful, and wonderful energy that each of us is to use, to develop, and then use for the betterment of all humankind. This is the destiny for which we were born. Is he, is he, is he the person who was interviewed the most for the film? As absolutely. Far as yeah, yeah. We interviewed him three times, almost six hours. At the time we started, we thought we were going to talk about all the schools. So we were talking about elementary schools and middle schools and how it affected Muir. So we did our first interview at Elliott, because that's where he went. It was bringing, we had these great interviews. I mean, hours of wonderful interviews about like what it was to go to uh, an integrated schools in the early 70s. And we talked about like, because I went to McKinley, he went to Elliott. We had very similar experiences. And, and it's about how race was being dealt with because here we are 50 years later, Nishan, and things have not changed that much. And that's sad because they were changed quite a bit just between 70 uh, and 1990. I mean, those 20 years, things changed radically. And then because everything stopped, because they put an end to integration, we're now in this state of arrested development in terms of race and race relations. Mm -hmm. It's it's only become more heightened in some ways because of social media and our ability to fractionalize our, our, our communications and talk only to people who think like we do. But we, we both had this moment and, and we interviewed where we were both talking uh, about when Roots came on TV in 70, I'm gonna say. 78. 77, 78, mm -hmm. yeah. And how it changed how we spoke to each other about race. Because for the first time, even black kids were not taught about slavery, no. right? And white kids now had to deal with the fact that their black classmates at one time were stolen away and put on ships. And I think it's it, that conversation, I wish we could have kept in the film, but it was really about middle school. It was or what we call junior high, because that's when those conversations were happening for us. So yeah, he was always going to be the voice. He was going to be the narrator. He was going to lead us through the history of Pasadena. And I was going to do a lot of the writing, but he was going to co-write it and it was going to be awesome. And I was living in Shanghai at the time, another one of my wife's uh, relocations, trying to edit together the outline of the, what was going to be the piece that he was then going to, we're going to weave his A storyline into. Okay. And then I got the news that he had passed away. And I was like, well, now what do I do? Because it's now just like a history of schools and a history of mirror. Mm -hmm. And as interesting as that is, to people who went there and maybe the people who donated money, that's mm -hmm. not, uh, I'm, I'm aware of the larger audience that I'm trying to reach. I'm not trying to just reach people who are alumni of John Muir High School. I wanna, I wanna reach the person who's, you know, in uh, Wisconsin. And then- How did, how did you the, work around his death? Well, the person who should be credited 
was saving this film. His name is Carl Furman. He's on the credits as story editor. He's an uh, award-winning filmmaker, went to UCLA a couple of years after me, but we have many friends in common. I worked on a film that he was the editor on about two years before I started this project, and we hit it off, and I could tell genius when I see genius. So he was editing a film uh, documentary for uh, my friend Pam Tom at that moment, and I said, I really need to talk to you because I need someone who's really smart <laughs> to help me figure out this film out. And he said, I don't know, I'm working with Pam, although, and I said, do you think you can get away for a week or two? He goes, yeah. So I mailed him without his knowledge, a ticket from LA to Shanghai. And he hopped on a plane two weeks later and landed. And we sat down at a, primarily at a bar, not too far from my apartment. And he figured it out. He said, look at Pablo. I know Cameron was important and his voice should stay in the film. But man, you're missing the forest for the trees. The reason this film is going to be amazing is because you went there and you're a parent. You're the story. And I'm like, I don't want to be the story. I don't want to, I never want to be in the front of the camera, Nashawn. I, I want to be behind the camera. I don't want to be in front of it. Mm -hmm. So I fought it. I fought it. I fought it. But by the time he left two weeks later, we had sketched out exactly how my storyline was going to work. And that I was going to ask the question, would I send my son to John Muir High School? And that made all the difference. I'm not thinking that it's a better film without Cameron. I, honest to God, would have loved to have seen that film. I think mm -hmm. he would have he would have been compelling in a way that I was never going to be that compelling. But unfortunately, you, as a filmmaker, you have to be flexible. These things happen. Um, one thing about your film, I had seen it before and I had watched it again. And I guess I didn't realize I was unaware that Glendale was referred to as the KKK capital of Southern California. That was something interesting to 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 hear to learn. Yeah. Um, although shouldn't be surprised su surprised. Your film had extensive screenings uh, within the PUSD. With your film had has had extensive. I have to say the screenings at the private schools have been the best, and I'm going. I'm screening it at Poly next month, which is uh, the screenings at the public schools have been great, but the screenings at the private schools have been amazing. Man, you basically I'm waking up some kids. That's all I'm saying. I'm going to be screening at Poly uh, Polytechnic uh, next month, which uh -huh. is going to be lit. This was this was a comment. The film's premiere, the reception of the film from the community has has been beyond expectation. We filled the near auditorium, which had over 800 seats. We had to turn people at the door. I was blown away every time it screened in the Pasadena area. It's been a full house and 95% positive, which for independent filmmakers is amazing. And so now you're saying you're going to have you're going to have some screenings at some private schools now. I've already done some screenings at private schools. And oh, you already have. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Harvard Westlake brought me over. A lot of a lot of white guilt when I left. Polly uh, is going to be next. I've I've really enjoyed the screenings I've done for church groups. There's a group here, a religious, what do you call it when many churches get together called Harambe? I don't know if you know it. It's in West Pasadena, interdenominational, I guess. And they work for positive social issues. Are you doing weekly, like weekly screenings or monthly? Yeah, it's not weekly anymore. Now it's kind of weird. Like I, I don't have any scheduled for October, but I've got five for November. I don't know why that happens that way. A lot of the integrated schools chapters around the country are trying to organize. I already did one out in Cincinnati, and then we jumped across the river to Northern Kentucky University and did a screening there. And that was great because that was proof for me for the first time with a non-Southern California or a non-California audience. I did a Northern California tour to see that the that it does resonate with people who didn't grow up in California, which was important to me because that was one of my goals. Your film has had extensive screenings within the past, within the PUSD. How have community members who were previously unaware of the film's content and the political elements entwined in Pasadena's history and racial issues responded? I mean, universally positive. The only negatives I ever get is about my attack on Prop 13. Those are, tend to be older white people. It was based on taxation in 1978. Yeah. It was to fix the problem of older people not affording their property taxes because they gotcha. kept going up. Okay. And it was a legitimate problem. I'm not saying that it shouldn't have been fixed, but they shouldn't have done it the way they did, which was basically blow up the tax system. And, you know, California is suffering still. To this still moment. from that. 
The film screening, you observed its impact on individuals grappling with similar dilemmas regarding their children's education. This led to you recognize the film's potential as a valuable tool. You also noted that Mayor Tornick, upon viewing the film, expressed support and desire to share with the broader community. How did it feel for you to witness Tornick recognizing the film's potential and receiving such support from the city? Well, I'm going to say that support from the city. You know, he he was voted out of office six months later. So, yeah, the new Mayor Gordo is... Uh, He's he went okay. Mayor Gordo's story is that he came in as a legal alien and went to Madison and where he learned, you know, that that a kid from Mexico could grow up to be the mayor. And he went to PHS. And so the kicker on all of his, you know, he goes to a lot of PUSD events because he's mayor and he always tells that story. What he stops is that he has two kids and they both go to private school. So there you go. Oh. Okay. I, I, that's where that's where I leave his story. I don't I don't talk about his wonderful yeah. rise from immigrant non-speaking child to mayor. Mm -hmm. I go on that he doesn't commit himself to the larger community. Mm -hmm. Wow. So Pasadena is not one city. Pasadena has for a classic example is that there are several large foundations. I went to all of them for funding. None of them wanted to fund a, a documentary about race in schools. Since then, almost every single one has said that they think it's great now that it's done, right? Mm -hmm. Wish their name was on it, whatever. Mm -hmm. But when it came time to do underwriting for the national broadcast, and I said, there's an opportunity to show that the Pasadena community is behind the message of this film. They, they didn't, none of them gave money. The California Communities Foundation out of Los Angeles gave money. They are, they're really positive and progressive. We are individuals, families, communities, public servants, nonprofits, businesses, donors. We want a brighter future for Los Angeles County. And we're working hard to create it. Where there is silence, we raise a voice. Where there is need, we lend a hand. Where there are problems, we find collaborative solutions. We are advocates for change. Believers of dreams. Investors for tomorrow. We are the California Community Foundation. 100 years of transforming generosity into impact. Join us in building Los Angeles together. My, my film is reaching individuals. What do you call it? Open house, Tom Muir High School, 2023. I am a parent, not a filmmaker, not an alumni, just mm -hmm. a parent with a freshman, mm -hmm. right? So Dr. Gray says, because of the large amount of people coming, we're not gonna do it in the auditorium. We're gonna do it outside in the quad. So mm -hmm. all of the, the orientation, like where are you going to go for open open house? You're gonna we're gonna give you your child's schedule, and you're gonna go see all your the teachers, right? Mm -hmm. So he said it's amazing how many more parents there are, right? So I go out into the quad with my wife, and it's just like full of parents, and it is racially diverse. Mm -hmm. So. I was like, I get this chills. Like I was here from 2011 to 2018 making this movie. I know what an open house is like in Muir. I, I went to everything. I was I had I wanted to be knowledgeable about when people say, well, the school is like this, and I could say, no, it's not. And in fact, this teacher does that or this. So here I am in this quad full of these, this is, and this little Asian woman comes up to me and she goes, You're Pablo Morales, you're the one who made that movie. You lied. And I said, 
what? She goes, you lie. In the film, you said this school was all black and brown. Look around. It's not black and brown. And I said, well, it was when I was making the movie. <laughs> My wife said I didn't stop grinning the rest of the night. I was really happy. So in that one little place, I made maybe a little bit of a difference. You've created and produced a documentary that has left a lasting impact on the San Gabriel Valley and within the Pasadena Unified School District educating multiple generations and promising more in the future. As you reflect on your contribution to the community, how does this make you feel? Well, I, I, I didn't, I didn't, I wanted to touch people. I didn't think I would change anything. I don't think beyond the individual as an audience. As I said, uh, this open house at Mirror this last month kind of, it, well, it humbled me, I think, to think that I, when I said that Mir was a school, which I think at the time when I started the film was 98% black and brown, uh, I didn't really think people were going to come back to it. I thought this is how it was going to be until it closes, right? Because people are so prejudiced against public schools and definitely prejudiced against the integration. I will put that integration as two meanings. One where we try to integrate white spaces, which is people think is positive. And then there's white going into black and brown spaces, which people see as negative. And I don't think that one is better than the other. But I do think if you have an integrated community, you should have integrated schools because you end up with people like you and me, mm. right? So I wouldn't have wanted to go to school with all only black kids or only Latin kids, or only white kids. I mean, earlier, it just it's the diversity. It's it's the it's the experience that we end up not the experience. Well, yeah, it's it's what we walk away with from having mm -hmm. those experiences of being around people that are not like ourselves. That makes a richer it makes for a richer experience. And obviously it creates an understanding when you're a younger person. And, and what is the real, who are the real, what are the real power in our country is, is money and corporations. And it's interesting because a lot of them seem to be very eager to break down opportunities for people of color and to also break down the movements towards integration for financial reasons. But who are the people that are most into diversity now? And it's corporations, because they recognize that a boardroom of just white men won't make as much money as a corporate as a boardroom with women and people of color. Mm -hmm. um, um, when and, I was they that that should be our lead. <laughs> we should do what they want to do. Yeah. When, when when I was younger, had I not went to Marshall, I don't think I would have. I wouldn't have been more aware of Armenians at at a you know at the age of 12 or 13 or whatever but Pasadena has a large Armenian population for me public public schools was a, a bonus and a positive because it influenced me and impacted me at a young age going to watch TV shows be um, filmed live live shows recorded you know I knew I wanted to work in in film production I knew I wanted a career in entertainment in Hollywood, and it was being it was being exposed to that because of the drama department at at Marshall, Mrs. Smith, Rosalind Smith, and that just opened up this whole world to me, which was a world of escapism, especially all the stuff that was going on within my community and stuff in 1991 and 1992. To me, Pasadena is a beautiful place, a beautiful city. I don't necessarily believe or think that I would have gotten a better education at a private school. I had a I had wonderful times, fabulous times um, going to Marshall. I went to Blair and Muir and yeah, so. Well, that's great. Yeah, I think that's the story of most people who have been through Pasadena schools. You know, that's just the nature of, of public schools in general in Southern California, if you are open to the fact that they, you know, the ones that have an opportunity to be diverse. We do, we have it. And to answer the question to your film, can we all get along? We did get along. 
We did. It's not rhetorical. We 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 actually we actually did get along, and I had Mexican friends. Um, but that was outside of school. That wasn't that wasn't that wasn't really. I mean, I had Mexican family members, but that wasn't outside of. I had Mexican family members, but I also had Mexican friends who were within our religious community as well. Oh right, right. So, yeah, it was it was a lot of a lot of diversity. Yeah. yeah. Um, Owen Brown, the son of the famous abolitionist John Brown, is buried in the meadows of Altadena near El, El, El Prito. When and how did Owen Brown first come onto your radar? There's a guy named Paul Ayers. He's a local historian. He was doing a program about Owen Brown at the Altadena Town Council, Town Hall, Town Hall. And I went because Michelle Zach, who is uh, a friend and former Muir grad and a right. friend, actually, first and foremost, I think of my parents. I, I know her through them suggested I go and I learned a lot. And I always knew I grew at the at the foot of Brown Mountain Trail there at the end of Ventura and Casitas. And I always saw the sign that said Brown Mountain. And somebody had said when I was a kid, you know, that's named after John Brown. And it took me probably a little while of a come American history classes to learn who that was. But yeah. um, so I assumed that John Brown had lived up there. <laughs> I mean, I didn't know his life story well enough at that point to mm -hmm. think that, you know, he dies at Harper at Harper's Ferry. But the father, right. The father, yes. Well, he's a son. Uh, Owen is the son. Owen is the son. Without the father, there is no Owen Brown. And I don't mean that genetically. I mean, he became famous because he participated in his father's rebellion um, exploits. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a long story. I'm sure you got it from Michelle Zach, how they got the gravesite renovated and everything else. And part of the money they got from the historical re reservation was to do a film project. I listened to the committee on the day I was supposed to present my ideas, and mm -hmm. they were talking about how they wanted it to be something that was remembered for a long time. And so Michelle was has been a big fan of my documentary about Mirror and thought that I could make a regular documentary. And I surprised her by saying, you know what? I don't think a talking head documentary is what we need here. Because if you want people to know about it, you have to reach the kids. And the kids could care less about talking heads. What we need to do is some form of like animated short film. Hmm. And my, what I want to do is uh, focus on the fact that they are all learning American history. And it doesn't look like there's a lot of American history that happens in California. And I would like this to be a way for them to have a certain pride in where they're growing up and a link to those important events. And I said, and because it's abolitionists, I feel like it's something that a, every child, regardless of the color of their skin, could be proud of. Um, when I found out about it from reading Michelle Zach's book, which is my favorite book, Altadena Between Wilderness and the city, the, yeah. the city, I was blown away because I grew up in the meadows at one point and El Prito Road, like that lets out like my, we lived at, I think, 4219 Aurelia Road. I was just blown away that, you know, that history was like in my backyard that, and he's buried there. His body, his actually- yeah, still his, there. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's, I mean, never heard about that when I was growing up, you know? Right. So. Yeah, we, we have a tendency to, to forget things in Southern California because things grow so fast and change so quickly. Anyway, it's I'm still in post production. The person I'm trying to hire here is an artist in Rhode Island who is amazing. is going to help me with some of the illustrations. So, so it's all animation. Well, animation is a big title for what it really is. It's graphics. It's oh, motion graphics. graphics. We're taking old photographs and old lithographs, and we're kind of making them with After Effects, kind of change color, change you know the foreground to the background, and yeah, things yeah, of yeah. That yeah. Nature. Because the kids are going to want to constantly see things changing on screen and just zooming in on a photograph or panning like the, the guy uh, who does the PBS ones, the Burns, whatever. And Burns. I just don't think that's going to hold the kids' attention. And even this could be difficult to hold attention. So we're trying to make it really short. Are you doing the narration? No, I'm, I actually hired uh, Millicent Crisp. She's a mere grad, class of 72. Mm -hmm. uh, she, um, she was, her claim to fame and why she's in the Hall of Fame is that she was a recurring character on the Star Trek series. But she's oh. she she runs a nonprofit here, and she's 
she's still very interested in production and film. And she she helped me out on some of my, she was my um, coordinator for my screenings at Mirror. She was, she was great. Pablo, what is the title of the film? Is there a title? I'm not 100% sure. Um, I've got three or four working titles. It's weird because usually I come up with a title before I start shooting. I have like the title pops into my head. <laughs> this one has not been like that at all. But I'll, it'll be something like the story of Owen Brown or mm -hmm. you know, Above Altadena or something. I don't know, something like that. 60 minutes, 90 minutes? Oh, no, very short, 15. Oh, I thought it was like a feature documentary. No, 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 no. Oh, I just I just assumed that it was a feature documentary. Um, that's okay. It does, I, I I just you call it educational film. That's all I'm. An educational film that's yeah. still still going to be impactful. You uh, were recently awarded a grant from Pasadena Arts and Culture for a community theatrical production of your new play, Jackie and Julia, which imagines fictional meetings of former president cultural icons Jackie Robinson and Julia Childs. What's the status of that? Have you assembled your cast members yet? <laughs> no, I have. I had to give a schedule for to get the grant. And I have until June of 2024 to put on a rehearsal, basically. Uh -oh. I wrote the script as a teleplay. And uh, when I first came up with the idea, I thought, oh, this could make a great theatrical piece, but I just never think of theater. I always think of cameras. The friend of mine who has gotten these grants before said they don't fund film and television, but they might fund a theater piece. Mm. So I just put it in, I honestly, Nishan, I had no idea. I felt like I felt like I was applying for film school again. I'm not going to get this. I never get grants. I'm a finalist. I'm never a winner of these sort of things. So when I won, I was like, oh, shit, now I got to do it. I've been doing a lot of research because I did the whole thing came because of of uh, when we got shut down for a pandemic. We were in the process of looking. We uh, we just bought the house here, but it was being renovated. So we were living in an apartment in Pasadena, really close to the Central Library. And okay. before they closed the library, I used to walk into the Pasadena history section and there were like two faces that you saw all the time. It was Julia Childs and Jackie Robinson. And I was like, mm. you know, they kind of grew up at the same time. I wonder if they'd ever met. So I read each of their autobiographies and it was like, oh no, they never met. They were in completely different circles. But I didn't realize she was from Pasadena. Pasadena. What? I didn't know she was from Pasadena. Yeah, Julia she grew Childs. up in Pasadena. No She's idea. She's a polytechnic girl. She came, she came from one of the wealthiest families in Pasadena and Jackie came from one of the poorest. And, you know, because that's what I do. I conceptualized over the course of an afternoon three times when they could have met based on their autobiographies. And then I decided I would make a three act, actually it's three scene, one act play about Pasadena where she represents rich white Pasadena and he represents new poor black Pasadena. The problem right now is I don't have a lot of drama. It was a lot. Of, it's a kind of a very comedic scenes about two people who don't understand the other person's lives, right? And yet they grow up a mile apart from each other. So what I have to do now, which I will do as soon as I finish the Mirror Museum, because that's what I, that's my number one. I mean, the Owen Brown thing. Luckily, I've got an editor working on most of it. But my day to day is I'm trying to get the the Muir Museum ready for homecoming. Near um, museum now? Yeah. It's had one since you were there, 96. Oh, I, it's I, okay. I, Nobody knew about it. I'm I'm making it, I'm modernizing it. It's, oh. it's going to be pretty awesome. Oh, wow. When you're in town, I'll take you on a tour. Yeah, I'll be there this December, January, and February. Yeah. Oh, That'd be nice. Plenty of time. So you are, you're still developing the, the, the play. Yeah, yeah, I'm right. I, I've got the story. I've got the characters. I've got the scenes. Mm -hmm. It's the dialogue it needs to be worked on. And before Beverly Hills was ever built, there was an elitism and I'm fascinated. I'm working on a project right now that looks at two Pasadena residents who grew up in the same era, but had completely different lives. And that is Jackie Robinson. But just a mile away from him grew Julia Childs, who went to West Ridge and had a very elite upbringing, ended up going to a boarding school up in Northern California for part of time went to Smith's College. But to me that they could live so close together and have completely different realities. It's fascinating. It speaks to what is Pasadena. Yeah. Your, your quote. Yeah, I think uh, I, at the time I said West Ridge, I think she actually went to Poly. Oh, Polytech. Oh. Earlier, you mentioned the, the Altadena mural. If you had a chance to create a mural in Altadena somewhere, mm. who would you put on it? Wow. In West Altadena. 
I would say West Altadena. In West in West Altadena. Because this is where that was. Right. Um, you know what I would do? I, I would do, there's so many. And a lot of them already have them. I mean, Charles White would be one, the artist, and maybe get his son Ian to actually do it. The, it's almost like a person. I wouldn't do a person. I would do, a. I would do, um, Wow, uh, because you know Altadena, uh, there is no, there's no part of America is exactly the way it used to be when I was growing up then, you know, and 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 that's that's just life. Things change, and and I don't know. I know that my son won't be playing touch football on in the street. Mm -hmm. He won't scrape his knee either. So there's a positive, I guess. But Altadena, you know, there's a there was a mural I saw years ago that. Uh, I don't know where I saw it, but I, I, it reminded me of Altadena. And what it was, was it was a collection of hands, like in a circle, mm -hmm. just uh, overlapping each other, but just little bits. And every single hand was a different shade, mm. you know, from far white to far black. Mm -hmm. And I think something that gives me that kind of a feeling like this is this community is is diverse and it's naturally diverse. It's not like in after after redlining was over, it still is a place. There's only one other neighborhood like it that I've ever seen, and that's Ladera Heights, where middle okay. class blacks still want to move. And unfortunately, both like Ladera Heights and uh, Altadena is becoming overpriced. So but I do know some relatively wealthy families of color that have moved in. And I think they know that they feel comfortable here. Mm -hmm. now, anyone can feel comfortable in West Altadena. I think that's the beauty of it. Um, Pop, do you want to say something? No, I was going to say thank you. Oh, thank you. Th th thank you, Pablo. Thank you. And, and I'm going to watch the film again another time. And looking forward to the Owen Brown documentary and the eventual Julia Childs and Jackie Robinson play. Oh yeah, me too. I'm looking forward to that too. <laughs> Thank you, Pablo, and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you so much. Bye -bye.